All right, here we go. So, if you have your Bible out, I'd invite you to get that out. If not, uh, do you have notes? You should have notes. You should have found notes, maybe. Anyway, you know, we're, we're in 1 John, and we're continuing to focus on uh, what we're calling living in the light. And tonight we get to a, a, a very, I think, a very interesting section, which is very pertinent for the times that we're living in now. To kind of get, get you thinking just a little bit, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you've been asked to follow somebody, like in a car? Have you ever, you ever done that? Where where maybe somebody is going to a destination and you don't know you don't know how to get there you don't know where it's at and so they said look just get your car you follow me and I'll get you there okay you know what I'm talking about all right and you know how troublesome that can be because maybe what you found out is that some people who who actually are the leaders in the cars you know who who take the lead role. Sometimes they're not very good leaders. And what I mean when I say they're not very good leaders is they they just they don't they forget that they're actually leading somebody. They're not just driving there themselves. You know, if you're just driving there yourself, you're not really paying attention to the people behind you so much, you know. So when you come to a, a light, if the light is green, you go. You don't think about, you know, is the light turning or is it yellow and you know, you just get through. But if if somebody is following you, you need to pay attention to that. So if you are following someone, you know, it's hard sometimes to because leaders aren't always uh, uh, what they're what they're cracked up to be, I guess. Uh, there's a lot of times if you're in traffic, you know, sometimes the pace of traffic can change. And so you you might get a couple or three cars behind somebody and then you're looking for them and, you know, it's almost a little bit dangerous as we're driving down the road trying to focus on headlight or taillights that belong to the car that we're trying to follow and make sure we do what they do because we don't we don't know the way. See, that's the whole problem. We don't know the way. And so what we're going to be talking about tonight is a phenomenon in the church that John writes about. And he's he's talked about this before. We've already talked a little bit about this in an earlier section. But what he's bringing back up again, and he's, he's bringing it up in a bit of a different way, is the idea of uh, who do you follow because there are many voices out there, just like I was talking about in my prayer tonight. There are so many voices out there that are representing, supposedly representing God and are asking us to follow them. And how do you know which one is legitimate? How do you know which one is true? How do you know... You know, uh, and you might say, well, that's that's pretty easy. You just, you know, follow the one that follows the Bible. OK, yeah. And you see, I'm smiling about that. Why am I smiling? Because I have found that uh, it's really kind of possible to make the Bible almost say whatever you want it to say. Depending on your motivation, depending on your, you know, all kinds of things. So it, it's very complicated. It's not surprising that a lot of people just kind of throw their hands up in the air and say, you know what, look, all I'm really concerned about is where I'm going to spend eternity. Everything else is kind of gravy. Everything else is kind of, you know, I don't, I don't know. And see, that's a problem. That really is a problem. Because if that's the attitude that we develop, what we're doing is we are going to miss out on the whole uh, purpose of why we're here. Are you saying, brother, that, that God didn't create us so that we can spend eternity with him? No, I'm not saying that at all. He did. But as we're learning here in these studies, and especially what we're learning in, in uh, our worship times together on Sunday... It, if it isn't clear to you that God wants to live in partnership with you and that that means that he has a purpose, a task, he has a vocation for you. If you haven't, if you haven't figured that, then I'm either a really lousy preacher and teacher or you're not paying attention. Okay, 
and it could be some of each. Okay, look, I'll, 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 I'll own part of it, okay? But you're going to have to own part of it, too, because, you know, it's clear. It's clear in Scripture, and that's the, that is the point that we've been over. You know, we're supposed to live distinctive lives. Why? So that we can partner with God and accomplish His purposes, okay? This is what we're here for. So basically, if we just kind of throw up our hands and say, well, I, I, how am I supposed to know what the Bible really says about X, Y, and Z? Uh, well, you, you, I would just urge you to fight that urge, fight that, that feeling. Uh, I probably don't need to remind you about the way it is in the church today, the American church. There is, a, you know, everybody wants to follow Jesus. That's what we say. But it has, it, the way people are, are understanding following Jesus is really, it's really strange. Uh, I, I find, and, and listen, what I'm talking about now is not society. What I'm talking about is within church, churches, okay, congregations, okay? Forget about what the world says. Forget about what our culture says. I'm talking about just in churches. In churches today, we find people, we find follow, people who consider themselves followers of Jesus on 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 literally every side of every moral issue. I know followers of Jesus, very devout, they would consider themselves devout followers of Jesus, who, uh, you know, practice all kinds of things that clearly the Bible says is wrong. You know, taught from, from, uh, from the standpoint of, oh gosh, where to start, uh, sexuality to marriage to family, to work, to, uh, to uh, you know, issues that relate to justice and the poor and all kinds of things. Man, there are Christians on literally every side of each other. And oftentimes we find ourselves arguing with each other, other over things that uh, many of them have are well-settled teachings in the Scripture. And it's just, ugh, it's annoying. Um and so we need to we need to get this figured out for ourselves, <coughs> and we need to to uh, as we you know have an opportunity like we're doing tonight to do this together to encourage one another. Uh, where we're at tonight is in First John chapter four. I want to read verses uh, one through four to you, and I want you to consider this point with me first. Then uh, he's going to be talking about about falseness and truth. You know, what is false and what is true? And let me suggest to you tonight this point, and listen for this kind of as we're reading verses 1 through 4 of 1 John 4. Falseness is rooted in, def in redefining, redefining who Jesus is. Falseness is rooted in redefining who Jesus is. This is 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Now let's talk about Antichrist for just a second. And again, we don't want to get hung up on that word. We've already talked about that once in this study. Uh, John's already referred to this. And he makes a good point here that a lot of us as followers of Jesus, this is one of the places where there's a lot of unclear thinking. A lot of people believe that there's this person called Antichrist who is going to come and that a lot of what's written about in particularly the book of Revelation is relating to someone called Antichrist. And you'll notice he's saying Antichrist is not something that's coming. Antichrist is here. He's here. He's here. Did you hear that? He is already in the world. 
So as we try to figure out just exactly what it is that he's talking about, he gives us a clue. He's saying it centers in the concept, and we talked about this a few weeks ago when we were doing it, it centers in this idea of who Jesus is, the identity of Jesus. Because it is the, anti the spirit of Antichrist that is trying to tell people that Jesus didn't come the way the, the scriptures say that he did. Now John is saying here that there are going to be many voices, he calls them spirits, that will be heard and will lead unsuspecting people away. And as we talked about when we talked about Antichrist before, the, the main issue that they were dealing with in the first century was something called Gnosticism, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M, Gnosticism, or Gnos, being a Gnostic. Uh, Gnosti, Gnostic, uh, that word uh, Gnostic or Gnosis, Gnosis, it has to do with knowledge, knowledge, or one who knows. And uh, basically what the Gnostics believed is that humans are made up of, of two entities. There is the spiritual and there is the fleshly. And in the world they believe that there is that which is spirit and that which is flesh, that which, and that which is spirit is inherently evil, or excuse me, <laughs> wrong. That which is spirit is inherently good. That which is flesh or physical is inherently bad and unredeemable. Okay? So, uh, the problem that these Gnostics had with Jesus is that the scriptures are quite clear. In fact, John says this in his gospel and he starts out this letter by saying that Jesus is both God and man. He is both, he is uh, both flesh and spirit, if you will. Okay? So the Gnostics are thinking, okay, well, we have a problem here. Because in our view, you can't, that doesn't work. That's like, what is it, like oil and vinegar, or oil and water, right? They don't mix, you know? And so, in their view, Jesus must not really have come in the flesh. It only appeared like he came in the flesh. But he was really only spirit. If he And, and so, uh, you might say, well, what, what difference does it make? Well, it makes a huge difference, especially when you start talking about things like resurrection. Okay? Because if he's just a spirit, then resurrection, and you say, we're going to resurrect like he did, well, how's that going to work? Because we're, you know, we're flesh. See, if you start to filter through these ideas and start to you know, think about them a little bit deeper, you start to realize, hmm, that doesn't add up. Which is a good, you know, thinking is always a good thing, right? Thinking is always a good thing. Um, but, you know, the scripture also says that Jesus was, in, in Genesis, it says that Jesus was present. And uh, Colossians says that he was the create, actually the creative part of the Godhead who was causing everything to come together. You know, uh, uh, in the beginning God created the heaven, heavens and, and so forth. Let and when he's talking about man, let us talking about the Godhead, let us make man in our image and so forth. Now you might think, well, what diff again? What? How big of a deal is this? Well, here's the thing: what these Gnostics were teaching is you should follow Jesus because he's he's a spirit and he's you know you should follow him. But since the flesh is inherently bad, it's unredeemable. Essentially, what they were also saying is. What you do in the flesh really doesn't matter. So you can begin to understand why so many times in the Bible it, it talks about issues of lifestyle, issues of marriage, issue of sec, issues of sexuality, all kinds of issues that have to do in the realm of our life here on earth. Why? Because if we truly are followers of Jesus, these are areas that are going to be brought under his lordship. He, we are going to submit these things to, uh, to his lordship, to his control, and we are going to act differently as we've been talking about. But if Jesus really isn't both God and flesh, if he's, if, you know, if he's just a spirit, and you know, then all this, all this stuff is really you don't need to bother with it. And frankly, that's what was happening in a lot of the churches. The people were. You know, they were gathering together, they were thinking that they were walking faithfully with God, and, and essentially they were 
doing whatever they wanted to do the rest of the time. You know, the flesh is bad. You know, you want to go get drunk, who cares? You want to have sex with whomever, okay, whatever. You want to be faithful to your marriage vows, eh, you know, it's optional. Uh, and all these kinds of things uh, where Paul, James, John, you know, pretty much every, every writer of the scripture teaches, a, and Jesus, not to mention Jesus, teaches that, that the life that we live here on earth is to be lived in such a way as to reflect the Lordship and the Spirit's control within our life. So uh, we do need to make good choices about what we're doing. So it re it's, it's of paramount importance, uh, and that's the bottom line in your notes. It says the bottom line is understanding who Jesus is remains a paramount of paramount importance to following him well. We're talking about following tonight. This is where he's leading us. He wants us to follow him in these ways, in these ways. And so the first thing we have to sort out is who is Jesus? And that's what John is saying. You're going to have these 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 spirits, these false prophets who are going to go out and they're going to tell you stuff which is false, not true. And it is going to center around the idea of who Jesus is. So be aware of it, avoid it, know it for what it is, and realize it is not the truth. Okay, but there is an alternative. And he tells us what that is. Go on then. The next point is John's answer is to acknowledge the presence and power of the Holy Spirit and to listen. His answer is to acknowledge the presence and power of the Holy Spirit and to listen. Look at what it says in, in verses 4 to 6 of 1 John 4. You, dear children, are from God and, over, and ho have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows listens, knows God listens to us, but whoever does not, who is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Now what, what John is saying is that there are essentially two voices out there. And he's not just talking about voices like we would hear audible voices in that sort of a way. Actually, he's taking this to a very much higher level, which goes right along with classic Christi Christian thinking. Okay, What happens when we decide to become a follower of Jesus? What is required is for us to move away from the idea of 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 who is in control, whether it's us or something else of our lives. Essentially, what we say when we follow Jesus is, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that he is the Messiah. I believe that he is the Lord. That's, what, that's essentially what it is that we confess uh, as, we're being prepared, as we're being prepared to be baptized. And then, of course, Baptism is something which God has given to us. We're going to talk about this a little bit more on Sunday because it comes up in, in uh, 1 Peter and, and uh, with respect to the resurrection. Baptism is the experience that God gives us where he tells us that this is the, this is the place where uh, the Spirit comes to us and not only does he come and live within us, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The he that is in you is talking about the Spirit. And if you are in Christ, if you, if you have had that experience, then what he's saying is that this voice that he's talking about isn't some you know, arbitrary voice that he's talking about. He, the voice that he's talking about is actually within you. It's the Holy Spirit who wants to lead you and guide you. And what he's saying is, that because we, as those who have the same Spirit, are teaching you, the Spirit that is within you and the Spirit that is within us is the same Spirit, there should be agreement, there should be fellowship, there should be consensus. So what you hear from us should be such that you trust it, that it is truth. Now, the other 
they that are in the world that he's talking about, he's back to these false prophets. And the reason they're false prophets is because they are espousing a, a viewpoint from a, from a spirit, a spirit of Antichrist, which we've already talked about. So this is, this is what he's talking about when, when he is saying these voices. And uh, it's, it's very important that, that we uh, are careful about the voices that we listen to. You know, it really is. Uh, we, should, we should scrutinize those voices. Because, uh, as I've already pointed out, there is an awful lot of division and different thinking within the body of Christ as about all kinds of issues. Well, now, how are we supposed to know? Because n not everybody looks at everything the same. Right. Okay. But I, I know that not all Christians are ever going to agree on everything. Okay. I get that. I understand that. But what I'm talking about are the fundamental, the basic kind of core Christian doctrines. Who is Jesus? Who is the Spirit? Who are we? You know, uh, and, and things like that. And if, if, if someone is talking about Jesus, for example, who's kind of an important part of our faith, wouldn't you say Jesus is kind of an important part of our faith? Maybe. If people can't even get that right, you should not listen to anything else that they have to say. Because if you can't get a core teaching right, it's kind of like if you can't get a if you can't get simple arithmetic, then don't try to teach me algebra, okay? Because you know it's all based upon it's building upon that. If you can't get the simple stuff right, if you can't get the basic stuff right, then that's probably not a voice that you're going to want to listen to with respect to other things. And that's what John is saying here. We need to acknowledge the presence of the Spirit. Which now can you kind of understand why I was I was uh, focusing on the birthday of the church, the the coming of the Spirit, and the the Holy Spirit uh, being a part of our lives, and and I mean we saw what the Spirit did on the day of Pentecost as as Peter preached and as people responded, and you know it wasn't it really wasn't if you read the book of Acts you'll discover that what happened on that day especially with respect to the, the 3,000 whose lives were, were changed that day, repent, were baptized, and we read about these people, their lives, they really begin to show us a picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to live in community, to, be, to live as if Jesus is Lord. He is the ruler of the world. What does that look like? And as you read... You know the last the last parts of Acts chapter two we often kind of just gloss over uh, because we get past kind of the good stuff you know the the sermon and the three thousand and you know all that kind of stuff but it talks about what they were doing after that and and it gives us a picture of what life what congregational life looks like what it looked like from the very beginning from the birth of the church and how that should be what we are about today well that leads me to the last point and. And that is that Christ followers can veer away from Jesus when we follow an incorrect Jesus. We can veer away. We can get off the path. And we, when we get off the path, how that happens is, you know, life is filled with a series of decisions that we make, isn't it? I mean, we have to make decisions about all kinds of things every day. Uh, and some of them are, are, I suppose, we might consider to be rather trivial. You know, uh, do I take a shower today or not? Do I, you know, do I, what am I eating for breakfast? You know, and, and that kind of stuff, which probably in the world of, of spiritual things is, are not, you know, life-shattering things. However, there are a lot of decisions that we make every day that are either either feeding our faith or, or steering us away from Jesus. And so we need to, to be cautious about those things. Uh, and, and let me suggest to you the places that, uh, that you need to be very mindful. Let me suggest three to you. And this is going to be easy to remember because they all start with T. Okay? Time, talent, treasure. Time, talent, treasure. These three things. 
every day you and I make decisions about how we are going to spend our time, how we're going to spend our treasure, the, the money, the resources, material things that we have, and the talent that God has given us. Okay, We have to make decisions about those things. And those places, those three things, uh, are places that you and I need to scrutinize in our lives because these are places where we oftentimes go, we, we can start veering off. Um, the question we could ask ourselves, you know, with respect to our time, uh, how much time is the right amount of time for us every day to spend talking to God, reading His Word, uh, engaging in, uh, you know, just fellowship with Him, just interaction with Him, personal, what we might call personal time with God. How much is the right amount? I don't, the Bible doesn't tell us what the right amount is, okay? But here's what I, here's what I do know, that if we, uh, if we're finding it difficult, and, and I hear Christians struggle with this all the time, if we're finding it difficult to find time to read God's Word every day, you know what that's telling you, what that's telling me? If, I, if I'm having a hard time finding time reading God's Word every day, I'm too busy. I am misusing the time He gave me. He gave me the time He told me to manage it. Now, I am now a follower of Jesus, so that by definition, I should be using whatever resources he gives me, time, talent, treasure, to enhance, to, to advance, and to announce his kingdom. So uh, I should be looking at these resources, my time, my talent, my treasure, and asking myself, how am I managing those things uh, in such a way that reflects the fact that I'm a believer and I'm a follower of his, that that, and to feel good about that. And I would, you know, just start right there. Because every day you and I make decisions. And some of the decisions that we make are bad decisions. Let's just call it that. I, I make bad decisions all the time. And uh, there are reasons that we make bad decisions. Part of the reason that we make bad decisions is because we allow all kinds of factors like emotion and, uh, and uh, well, emotion's a big one, to influence us and to do things to uh, maybe because we're afraid or maybe because we're insecure. There's all kinds of things going on. And so I would encourage you to kind of just kind of take an inventory of those three things, your time, your talent, your treasure. And, and just ask yourself, you know, if, if this isn't something you should be afraid of, you know, these, uh, you know, hopefully you agree with me. These are resources that God has given us to use for his glory. Okay. That's what the scripture teaches. If that's true, then we shouldn't have a problem. In fact, we would be foolish not to look at how we're managing those resources. You know why? Because parable after parable after parable tells us that one of these days there is going to be an accounting. That means we're going to have a given account of the things that God has entrusted to us. What kind of things? Time, talent, treasure. These are the, the I mean, there's other things, but this is, this is a huge, you know, this is a huge part of it. And so how, how are you managing those resources? You know, another place I would, I would look to see if, if I'm following the right Jesus has to do with uh, maybe some of the habits in your life. Uh, there are habits that we have in life that are, are good habits, and they lead us to positive things. And there are habits that we have that are not good. Uh, again, one of the key factors that you're going to have to deal with, I know I have to deal with it too, is just the whole concept of busy, being too busy. And um, you, you really need to you really need to spend time and spend time. I can't. I'm too busy. Huh? No. But seriously, we need to spend time 
challenging that argument in our head. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Okay, hey, who's setting your schedule? Now, you, if you have a boss, you probably have a boss who's telling you what you need to do with part of your time, right? But not all your time. There's an awful lot of the day that you, yourself, and I, you, have control over. You're the manager, so manage it. You know, if you're saying you're too busy, you're saying you're not a very good manager is what it's saying. I'm sorry, that's pretty blunt. But sometimes we need that. I need to hear that once in a while. Tony, if you're too busy to spend time reading God's Word, you're a lousy manager. Okay, I can hear that. And I don't want to be a lousy manager. So I set aside time every day to spend in God's Word. Well, that's easy for you. You're a preacher. Yeah? No, it's not. Because it's easy to talk myself into thinking stuff like, well, you know, I'm writing sermons, I'm spending time in God's Word, I'm preparing Bible studies, that's enough. I'm not talking about that. The time that I'm talking about where I'm spending in God's Word is time where I am reading or I'm listening to God's Word. Sometimes I listen to it because sometimes I, I like to hear it instead of just reading it. Uh, but I spend time listening to God's Word and he reading God's Word and just meditating on God's Word that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about on Sundays or any other time. Like right now, I'm going through the book of Romans. And uh, chapter 7 is what I was uh, focusing on today. I, I focus, you know, you, it, you have to figure this out yourself. Now, in terms of how you manage it. Now, if you need some help with some tools, that's why pastors, that's why elders are here to, uh, to help you. If you need help getting, it, getting started or finding ways to do it, you know, say, brother, I need help. I'll help you. Okay? But I'm not a mind reader, you know, so if you want some help, let me know. I'd, I'd love to do that. You know, Camille is, is a great student of God's Word, too. And, uh, you know, she could, she could help you uh, sort some things out as well. But listen, uh, we need to start arguing. We need to start now. We need to stop arguing about settled matters. Uh, the Bible says a lot of things that are, are settled. And we need to stop arguing with him about it. Well, but the Bible's an old book. Well, can we trust the Bible? Well, you know, this is the 21st century, blah, blah, blah. And that's what that is, okay? Uh, we need to, if you're going to, listen, if you're going to accept the notion that, that what we're reading about in the Bible about Jesus and this whole concept of eternal life and all of that, where did you get that from? You got it from the Bible. So you can't turn around and say, well, I'm not going to listen to what the Bible says about this because it's an old book and it's not up to date and what, whatever. Okay, stop that. That's ridiculous. That's, that's just ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> and we need to stop that kind of thinking because the only person that we're fooling is ourselves. So the question you know, we really need to be asked, well, how do I, how do I learn this? Well, uh, John says there's a, something inside of you calls the Spirit. He says he, is, he and those with him are the source of truth also because they have the Spirit. But, <clears throat> you know, so much of what we read about in the New Testament, I mean, the New Testament, the Bible, is written by people inspired by the Spirit. Uh, we read Paul writing to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is inspired. It is God-breathed. That means God breathed into the Scripture. So we can trust the Scripture, okay? And, and so we should be good students of the Word. And when things don't make sense to us, that's fine. That's why we reach out. That's why we study. That's why we clarify. We ask questions and so forth. So if we want to have an accurate picture of Jesus in order to follow him, where are we going to find that? Well, we're going to find it in his word. We're going to find it from, from faithful teachers of God's word. Uh, we're going to find it, and, and you know, faithful teachers of God's word are also people who are going to be living this in front of you so that you can be able to observe it as well. Okay, And see, that's the thing. Uh, part, of, part of the privilege that I have in and leading sessions like this and talking with you and, and, and you're submitting to listening to this tonight is because you have the expectation that, you're, that your minister, your pastor, your preacher, whatever you want to call me, uh, is, is living his life in the same kind of way as what he's talking about the scripture says. 
And you know, those are the same standards that, that I try to apply to my life as well, and Camille does to her life, and we encourage one another. You know, all of these things are, are ideals that, that we, are, we are trying to figure out ourselves. Now, we're not perfect, and we make mistakes, but we know how to confess, and we know how to move forward from those things. And again, part of why we have pastors and teachers and you know elders, deacons, and all those people is to help us get to these places, help us to better be able to do uh, and manage these things. So, but it really starts with who is Jesus, just as John is saying. The whole the whole susceptibility to false false prophets has to do with attacking the identity of Jesus. So be on your be on your guard there. Okay. So there are two couple of two basic things I just want to kind of conclude with tonight. Two two things we need to commit to uh, that I think are good encouraging ideals today. First one is the Spirit of God is in me, and He is greater than anything I will ever encounter on my journey for Jesus. Did you hear that? Greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. Can you say that with me? Greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. That's what John tells us here. Greater is the Holy Spirit in my life than any other possible voice, power, presence that I could listen to. Listen to the Spirit. Get familiar with the Spirit. Let Him lead you. The second truth is this. Truth can be known if I commit myself to seeking the real Jesus. As I... As I set my life on a course of trying to follow Jesus. That's why we're followers of him, right? The closer I follow him, the more my life will reflect that. And uh, where he's going is where I will end up too. Okay? All right. Hopefully that makes good sense to you tonight. And uh, and that's a help to you. Uh, let, me, let me say again just a couple of things. First, uh, if you have if you have a prayer request, let us know real quick, and we'll pray for that as we uh, as we get ready to leave tonight. Also, uh, again, if you would be interested in Camille and I either doing a video chat with you, or uh, coming in and uh, practicing some form of social distancing with you to be able to communicate with you, and and. Just so you know, you know, you might think, what do they, what does he want? What, why does he want to come visit me? Well, there's two reasons. <laughs> the first reason is because that's what pastors do. That's what we do. Okay. Uh, we want to know the people that are in the congregation. So we can know how to pray. We can know how to uh, encourage you. We want to know your family. Because we're family. You're our family. Okay? So we want to get to know you better. And let me just say, you don't need to be afraid of us coming, you know, to come and visit you. Um, you know, we're just regular people. Uh, but the other thing is, we want to we wanna just, uh, there's some questions I'd like to ask you. And they're not, they're not hard questions. They're just, I, I'd like to know your opinion about some things. Okay? And uh, uh, again, we just want to want to get to know you, and we want to give you an opportunity to know us better. You know, I just mentioned that uh, part of what you know uh, leaders and teachers try to do is to live their lives well for Jesus. And you know, you can't really see that. You can see it a lot better when you're up close to somebody, can't you? So we we just want to we want to share those moments with you and get to know you better. So. Uh, uh, Anyway, we hope that you'll let us know. If if you'd like to do a video chat, it, it, and if you want to respond tonight, just write video chat. If you want to do a porch visit, you know, and get on the schedule for that, and I know some of you have done that, have written porch porch visit, I'll get back with you. Either case, we'll get back with you in either uh, later tonight or probably tomorrow uh, to figure out, you know, when that's going to be. Uh, so we're going to be doing this for a while. You're going to hear me mentioning this because... We'd like to visit everybody in the church. We'd like to, you know, we'd like to get to know everybody. Okay, so help us with that. That would be uh, that would be awesome. 
I see you there, Brother Jim. All right, I'll, I'll hook you up, man. No worries. Um, anyway, uh, what else tonight? Well, don't forget, we continue to meet on Sunday mornings. Um, we, uh, we have two more uh, messages where we're going to be focusing on the resurrection. And I, I wrote the one for this Sunday yesterday, and I'm, man, I'm excited. And I'm really excited, too, about the one, the last one. Oh, man, we have some things to talk about that are going to blow your mind and how good God is. It's, it's going to be good. I'm really excited. You know, I get a little excited, but I'm really excited about that. So, and um, let's see, it's warm outside. It's 80 degrees outside. I'm digging that. And yes, we've heard that it's hot in Mississippi and there's humidity in Mississippi, but let me tell you a secret, okay? It gets hot in Kansas and it gets very humid in Kansas. So we say to Mississippi, bring it on. You know, we can we can take it. Let me tell you a quick story before I close. When I moved to New York, I used to be a preacher. Jim will remember this. Jim Dorfler, who's watching us tonight. Um... When I first moved to, to the, the congregation in New York, it's just outside of Buffalo. And you can imagine what Buffalo, New York, you've heard how bad Buffalo is. Whenever there's a bad snowstorm, they always show pictures of Buffalo. It's like Armageddon, you know. Anyway, I remember I, uh, I, moved, to, I moved to that area. It was like the middle of August that year. And, uh, you know, it was, I was so excited. I mean, I'm just so excited to be there and, and, uh, Anyway, everybody kept saying, man, you know it snows here. You know it snows here. You know it's, I thought, yeah, I know it snows. I'll bring it, you know. And I, I stood up in church one day and told these people, I said, you know what, bring it, because I am praying for snow. I've been wanting snow for a long time. And these people looked at me like I was crazy. So we got one bad year of snow that year. That was, that was so bad. Anyway, so bring on the humidity. Bring on the heat. We're ready for it, aren't we? We love it. We're loving it, okay. Uh, so with that, we're gonna we're gonna say good night. Uh, let me let me pray. Uh, let's let's pray together, okay. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all that you've done for us. We just thank you for the way that you provide for us, especially tonight as we've been reading about and and studying about your Spirit. I just pray that we would really get better acquainted with your Spirit, and and learn how to use his guidance direction in our lives in ways that that in, intensify our walk with you father bless us as a congregation bless us as your people as we uh, try to muddle through all of the voices that are out there that are trying to uh, influence us and give us give us a strong sense of, of your guidance and now, uh, as we close tonight, I pray that we would sense your blessing and that we would be eager to think about how, uh, if you will, we will serve you tomorrow and the day after. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, hey, it's good to, good to hang out with you. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of the week. We're looking forward to Sunday. We will see you Sunday morning. And uh, we will praise the Lord together. All right. God bless y'all. Have a great night. And maybe we'll see you on your porch or video chat soon. Okay. Good night. God bless. Brother, best preacher. That's funny. Okay. <laughs>